Welcome back at the co-director webinar series. We're currently uh, module seven on post-operative complications and its management. Um, it's a set of 11 modules on different colorectal subjects and we will progress with increasing difficulty. And uh, so we're in currently in module seven and we have one module left in the colon series with D3 and D2 uh, or T4 tumors. And then we continue to the rectal uh, modules. Uh, currently we have Two special guests, we have Willem Bemmelman, who is the lead colorectal surgeon of the Academic Medical Center in Amsterdam. And we have Michael Petsiba, he is the head of surgery of the University Medical College in Krakow in Poland. And of course, we have our uh, usual uh, faculty, Andreas Chamier from the Department of General Surgery in Kepler University Clinic and Walter uh, is also here, even though he won't present a case, but if you have questions for him, please let us know. We can continue now with the first presentation with Andreas. And Andreas is going to present about leakage and ischemia. Leakage and ischemia. We had a wonderful uh, session last, last webinar on complications, and this is was intraoperatively, now we are postoperatively. And um, there are two different diseases. If you have a leak after a colonic resection and if you have a leak after a TME procedure in a very low situation. And um, as you all know, the incidence going through the literature is very different. So colon should not be more than 8%, which is rather high to my opinion. And on rectum, you find figures from one to 2% up to more than 25%. So very different figures. But of course, they should be lower as presented and shown on this picture. The role of the surgeon is that um, uh, we can, we can, we are responsible and uh, we can prevent leakage, not in 100%, but if you do correct proper surgery, we can reduce the situation. And uh, first, of course, we have to make the anastomosis tension free. Um, if not, it's the surgeon's fault. We have to try to to do the best blood supply for the descending colon or for the colon for the anastomosis um, using a correct stapling technique, the correct um, technique on how to do the anastomosis. And uh, of course, it's not only the operation itself, it's also the pre and post-operative and perioperative management of the patient, starting with nutrition, with the fluid management, antibiotics and things like that. Um, I think, um, um, we have shown this video um, uh, on the ICG session. ICG we presented in the module uh, six or five, I think, and um, uh, which is now an additional tool to prevent for a bad blood supply. Um, this is an, uh, just regular tension-free anastomosis. And you can see here, this is not the best color, the last two centimeters and sometimes only due to the angle of the stapler, it looks a little more dark. We always do flexible endoscopy as I presented previously to check the color of the mucosa, to check the integrity of the staple line, which is also to our opinion and the literature very important, not only to put in a syringe and then using ICG, um, you can detect uh, very clearly if the descending colon is in a good blood supply and shown on this video, you see the last two centimeters are in bad blood supply. And um, if you go through the literature, Luigi Boni and the colleagues, um, all the well experienced surgeons now realize that using ICG, they could reduce the number of leakage because um, sometimes the macroscopic finding will fail. And in such case, you have to do a re resection. Um, um, I also showed the intraoperative flexible endoscopy to check the anastomosis. 
And um, we do this since 20 years in Austria, the surgeons do flexible endoscopy themselves. And um, if you have real high pressure, a good anastomosis resists. You can't spoil the anastomosis, but um, you will find better than in every other technique, a perioperative leakage as here shown. And it's almost the crossing of the circular and the linear stapling line. And then you have to do an oversewing um, uh, to check, check it again. Um, however, if you do not check your anastomosis, which is always recomm also recommended in the guidelines, um, you will have a higher incidence of leakage. However, leakage always will occur. And it's important that you take care of the patient and then you try to have an early recognition and the right and best management. So how can we, how can we check? Whenever mostly a laparoscopic patient, laparoscopic operative patient gets post-operative paralysis, it's suspicious. And it's, if the patient gets tachycardia, it's also suspicious. And it's not a cardiac problem, it's problem. It's almost not a pulmonary embolism. If the patient goes not good, the first thing you have to think about is the leakage. Also the CRP, I will go later on on the CRP as well. Then if this is elevated, then it's suspicious. If you have a high elevated CRP, you have to take care and go active and search if there is a leak either by endoscopy or by CT scan. So our strategy in our clinic is always to bring him, as I said, we do it ourselves and check by flexible endoscopy, the anastomosis. And uh, then if it's not clear, we also do a CT scan. The typical clinical signs, which we learned also from paratic surgery is the post-operative tachycardia. It's one of the first typical signs. Then the paralysis, if there is in left colon resection, rectal cancer, if there is a paralysis, it's always suspicious after even a, almost a laparoscopic procedure and the CRP. And also if patients are disorientated after the operation, it's always, if it's not the same uh, mental situation as prior to version, you have to think that there is some kind of septic process and check active if there is a leakage and bring him to the CT scan or to the endoscopy. Talking about CRP, there's a wonderful systemic review of SING, which is, uh, was published in the British Journal of Surgery. And um, they studied seven studies and uh, uh, almost 2,500 patients on colon and rectum. Um, they did the CRP levels uh, where here's the reference five in some papers and in some clinics it's 0.5. Um, uh, they did it on day one, two, three, four, five, and six, and um, they showed the cutoff levels um, when it's a highly suspicion of a leakage on day three, day four, and five. But they also found patients which have a high CRP and uh, no um, leakage. But on the other side, if the patient had a low CRP, it was almost no leakage. So they, they concluded that it's a very useful negative predictive test for the development of anastomotic leakage following colorectal surgery. And uh, whenever you do routine laboratory testing, you should also react on that and not just do a control, do a control, do a control, just if you do test, if you do routine CRP and fibrinogen and uh, lycocid or whatever, then you, there also should be a reaction um, after elevated um, findings. So if there is now the leakage demonstrated in the CT scan or endoscopy and everything is, is clear, then we have several options. We can oversue if it's not a very low rectal cancer by laparoscopic or open procedure. In the, in the very low rectum, I will talk later. I'm now talking almost on colonic um, anastomosis, um, open laparoscopically. Um, we can do a re-resection of the new anastomosis, plus minus diverting allostomy. And of course, um, there's always the possibility to do a complete diversion, like a half month's procedure, uh, in order to save the patient's life in a very, very severe 
situation with uh, uh, stercoral peritonitis. Um, show you just a short video. Um, a mean management of a leakage after sigmoidectopy, showing that if you have a good a patient in good condition, this was a young lady. As always, this was the mother of a doctor working on my department. And um, this was day three. And uh, she just had tachycardia, the typical flush in her face and uh, uh, the elevated CRP. So we went back by laparoscopy. And this is how it looks like on day three after sigmoidectomy to the sigmoid cancer. And then um, what we found was uh, using flexor endoscopy. You can see the severe adhesions on day three due to the peritonitis. And um, if you can see here the green, you suspect the leakage here, the stenostomosis. And, uh, and um, then we have to check if there's a good blood supply can use the ICG as well. We do flex endoscopy, the color of the mucosa. And if you have good condition, there's always just, uh, it was just a very small leakage here. Then you do, can do an oversewing of the anastomosis and the lavage and the drainage antibiotics. And uh, in that case, it went well without any lupulostomy, but this is not a general recommendation to do it without lupulostomy. It always depends on the local situation of the patient. It's always the decision of the active working surgeon in the theater. Another case, um, this was day four after sigmoid hemi of the left hemicolectomy. Looks a little different, uh, but it was also the same symptoms. Typically, the patient, they have a paralysis, they have a flush, they have temperature, more or less temperature, and uh, then we went just straight back in the OR, checked the anastomosis, and what we found is um, that there is um, a, as the typical sign on the crossing, the circular and the linear staple line, we found a leakage here, small leakage, it was just the muscularis and the serosa has, has been broken here, the small leakage, not severe peritonitis. What we did was again a laparoscopy, a real laparoscopy. We just made an oversewing anastomosis using lavage drainage, and it worked well. So, what about Hartmann? In that case, I, I love to present the not so recent paper from the year 2007 in the Annals of Surgery. Uh, Constantinides did a wonderful analysis on uh, studies comparing Hartmann versus resection and anastomosis plus protective stoma in diverticular disease and perforated diverticular disease and peritonitis. Of course, after a cancer resection, it's not the diverticulitis, but the peritonitis might be um, the same. And um, they, out of 200 papers, they selected 12. And in that, in that review, over a period of 25 years, almost all patients out of 7,000 patients, 6,600 got the Hartmann's procedure. And all just I want to show when we have different developments, not damage control strategies, lavage, drainage, and, um, and um, all the things, the Hartmann's procedure, we have to tell this also the young surgeons still have a, a relevance in the management of leakage also and of acute peritonitis due to a hole in the colon. And the result in this study was that um, after Hartmann's procedure, 27 had, a, um, uh, uh, had a, a permanent stoma. This is well known that most of the patient or half of the patient, uh, the elderly, do not uh, get... Uh, um, the, the colostoma removed and only a small group had a permanent elastomy. They checked also mortality and morbidity and the Hartmann procedure in the life-threatening situation had the lowest mortality and the lowest morbidity. The primary anastomosis and diverting stoma had uh, the best results talking on mortality and uh, 
uh, morbidity and the primary section osteomosis had the worst results. So they could, they also checked with the um, quality of life, which was similar in all patients. And they concluded that uh, the primary anastomosis with the function stoma might be just the compromise between Hartmann's procedure and primary resection without stoma with a low, the lowest morbidity and mortality. So should we do it open or laparoscopically? Well, it's up to the surgeon. He has to decide in the OR, but whatever he do, the first revision should work. If the first revision surgery fails, the second and the third um, will have a much more higher risk to fail. And it's always a life threatening complication. So uh, whatever the decision is, um, the patient should be uh, safe. It's, we have to do that, which we have the best possibility to save the patient's life. What about rectal cancer and TME? So it's a short, just in 20 minutes, I can just give you an overview. And this is, I think, the most important development over the last 15 years, the endosponge treatment for leakage. Um, uh, you can see the mortality is still high after an anastomotic leakage. And uh, the ideal treatment is not that amount because there is a lack of randomized trials, but we have already over the last 15 years, good data on that system, which you all may know, the sponge, and the system without uh, a vacuum machine, just uh, like um, a, a radon drain with a vacuum in the bottle, special equipment to introduce it. And you just uh, do after flexible endoscopy, you bring in the sponge, you put the suction, you just change every two to seven, every two to five days the sponge. And um, I will show you the data later on. Just a small case from our clinic, which was. Um, um, just after neoterm treatment, the uh, TME, and on day seven, he had an anastomotic breakdown. This is the CT scan where I can see the air bubbles around. This was the endoscopical picture here. On the right side, the lumen. On the left side, uh, the leakage, almost half of the circumference of the anastomosis. You all know these pictures uh, if you do many cases of rectal cancer. This is the picture with the sponge. We usually change it every three to four days, depending also if it's weekend or not. And this is after almost one month of treatment, it looked like this. And this is after three months of treatment, it looked like this. So this is a wonderful tool and um, which works best if you have a diverting stoma, which is in our clinic standard if you have neoterm treatment and a very low anastomosis after two centimeter. Literature on that is one of the first papers from the year 2008 it was just a, a cohort study, a report of a new technique on 29 patients. And uh, there it, it lasted also in the median just one month. I had a total number of sessions was 11 plus. And um, all of these patients also had a protective stoma. And after, um, after this period, um, from 29 patients, 28 patients could receive a definitive healing. In this paper, also some pictures. So they concluded that is a wonderful, efficacious modality for the treatment of leakage. And uh, further studies, of course, are mandatory. And now one of the uh, presenters today, the next lecture will give will be by Willem Bemmelmann. And with his group, they presented the first multicenter trial on that in the um, presenting a period of two years, 16 patients, half of them had primary stoma. And if you look on the right slide, um, so the, on the right side, um, after six, six eight patients, um, the, the time between uh, surgery and the treatment was less than six weeks in eight patients. And uh, um, in the other others, eight patients, it was more than six weeks. And they could uh, conclude that the earlier you begin with the treatment, the more effective it will be. And of course, the functional outcome have to be weighted. So five years ago, there is now a six year stretch of perspective analysis from a single center, also only 15 patients, but they succeeded in 12 patients. And however, in three patients, they also had to stop because of a failure of, um, of septic and in one time of bleeding. 
Um, uh, but they concluded that if you do it properly and if it's a really low anastomosis and the sponge treatment only works if the anastomosis is really in the low pelvic region, then you can also preserve the lumen and um, it, it permits the closure of the stoma without requiring any other re um, re reconstructive surgery. And finally, another paper um, over a period from three years, six centers um, um, uh, to talking about the late post-operative complications after sponge treatment. And this is you always have to be aware if after one month, after six weeks, when everything is fine and you just um, uh, finish the treatment, um, that there will be a chance after almost one ha half a year or or 12 months that there will be an abscess formation and a fistula and the osteomyelitis of the osacrum. And uh, they could analyze 20 patients and uh, out of these 20 patients, 25% developed recurrent abscess formation, which um, needed then a, a diverting Hartmann situation in three patients. One could be managed with a TT guided drainage and one of course, um, was at that time under discussion. They couldn't find the, um, the definitive result. Um, I'm not talking about the higher incidence of local recurrence and tumor recurrence due to lack of time, but all of these papers show that um, um, the endosponge treatment is a very good tool in order not to do a diverting situation, in order to save the lumen and the function of the of the of the neorectum and should be available, of course, in cases in, in clinics where you do rectal surgery. So our experience, it it is in good options. Uh, the earlier you start, the better the success rate will be. Um, you need good blood supply in order that you have a healing of the partial intact anastomosis. This you can check by endoscopy. And as we talked in the last uh, webinar, there is also soon available the uh, fluorescence, the ICG on flexible endoscopy. But we recommend from our experience uh, that the, if you have endosponge also the functions, the results are better if you have a diverting stoma. In general, I want to conclude it might be an options in patients after low anterior resection or TME with an anastomotic leakage, a low leakage, having a diverting stoma and a non-septic condition, meaning no general peritonitis. Um, and of course, whenever you perform rectal surgery, it should be in the year 2020 a standard that you can offer your patient this way of, of uh, servicing their problem. Thank you for your attention. So Andreas, one of the, of the question was that you always should do a Hartmann procedure because your failure to rescue is then the lowest. Uh, and if you have a leak, then your primary aim should be to save the patient and not to save the anastomosis. What's your opinion about that? As I said, it's a decision done by the experienced surgeon in the OR um, it's a multifactorial on the patient condition, on the on the on the um, qu quantity of uh, peritonitis, on the blood supply, and the real reason for the leakage. So uh, I'm not saying you have to do a Hartmann procedure in each case. No, um, there are several other options. Uh, but uh, I want to say that nowadays, in in on, on lectures. Everybody says you're not allowed to do a Hartmann, and the only thing I want to say there is still there's still a place for Hartmann in the year 2020. I, th I think if the anastomosis is intra-abdominally and the uh, the dehiscence is uh, let's say more than one third, then you probably have to take down the anastomosis. If it's uh, if the tissue is good and the peritonitis is not that bad, and you have a hole which is less than one third of the circumference. Then you can do a washout, oversue the hole, and put a ileostomy. If you would do a Hartmann for a very low anastomosis, then you have to realize that you will uh, it will be very difficult to join up. Then you will lose your anastomosis. Yeah, mm -hmm. So 
a Hartman procedure for a cola anal anastomosis will mean that you probably sacrifice the anastomosis forever. Yeah, but sometimes it's necessary if you want to save a patient, but that's a other discussion. We continue with the presentation of Willem. Uh, so the first question is, uh, because I'm going to talk about uh, eye layers. So we have here an 82-year-old male uh, who is five days after a laparoscopic D3, right colectomy for cancer. He, is, uh, he started to vomit, but he does pass some stool and his vital parameters are normal and his CRP is 45. So what's the most likely diagnosis? He has a postoperative paralytic ileus. He has an anastomotic leak. He has a gastrostasis or he has an opiate overdosis. May I have your votes? Okay. Well, that's great. So uh, we go to the second question. So we have the same patient, and uh, uh, so how would you treat this patient? Of course, this is really, this depends on how you answer the, que the, the first question, but uh, you can do watchful waiting with IV fluids, give the patient total parenteral nutrition, uh, place a duodenal uh, feeding tube or a core track, or do a real laparoscopy or real laparotomy. Okay. Good. Well, I think I have a mission now with my uh, uh, with my talk because there, there could be a little bit of improvement uh, in the answering. So let's close this and then I continue with the uh, the talk on uh, postoperative uh, ileus. So uh, if we look through literature, then the incidence of postoperative ileus is reported up to thirty percent, and we all know that it delays hospital discharge. It's uh, a potential for uh, uh, all kinds of other complications like uh, uh, pneumonia or thromboembolic complications, and it's associated with increased costs. And when you look through literature, then you will notice that there is not really a, a proper consensus uh, on what we actually mean with uh, a primary postoperative ileus. But the best what I could find was that it's a transient cessation of coordinated bowel uh, motility after a surgical intervention, which prevents effective transit. And then they separate patients who had laparoscopic surgery from open surgery. So if it's delayed more than uh, the transit, more delayed more than three days after, uh, more than three days uh, after laparoscopic surgery, it's called postoperative ileus. And then for an open surgery, it's five days. Uh, then we also have the secondary postoperative ileus, and it has the same definition, but then the cause are uh, secondary causes. For instance, a septic complication like an abscess or an anastomotic leak that can cause a postoperative ileus. And then I think what is very important is that we should discriminate uh, a postoperative ileus from gastroparesis, which is a gastroduodenal this dysmotility uh, with intact small bowel and colonic uh, movement. So what's, what's normal? So if uh, uh, after surgery, the, uh, the, the first organ which has restored motility, that's the small bowel, let's say with one, within one day, then the stomach follows uh, when one to two days after surgery. And the slowest is for sure the colon conduit, which is uh, uh, in between two and three days, which is, uh, so these are the, the normal standard figures for restoration of, of uh, motility. Uh, a couple of slides on the pathophysiology. So what happens during surgery is that uh, we enter first in a sort of neurological phase where the sympathetic system is triggered, followed, uh, which is relatively short, three to four hours, followed by an inflammatory phase by the manipulation of the intestine, all kinds of uh, cytokines and cells uh, are activated, show you that in a minute. And then when the ileus is uh, resolving, that's because of uh, the uh, incre an increase in uh, vaginal activity. So the first phase in the postoperative ileus is uh, caused by the uh, uh, activation of the sympathetic system 
Uh, so uh, not only the sympathetic system is activated, but also there are some hormones uh, released and they cause uh, slow down of the, of the GI tract uh, passage. Then the second is the inflammatory phase, which lasts longer, where due to um, manipulation of the bowel, pro-inflammatory cytokines are uh, released, which activate, uh, activate macrophages. And then through nit nitric oxide release, they inhibit the smooth muscle. And you have to realize that, um, for instance, if you have uh, this trigger uh, in a remote place, let's say in the pelvis, having a drain there, this could cause uh, a relatively uh, release of uh, activated macrophage, which will slow down the passage through the, the small bowel. So it, it, it has a, uh, a general abdominal uh, effect. So then uh, the evolution phase, uh, which is associated with vaginal activity, um, is, uh, is stimulating the, the bowel motility again. And that's where the idea comes from that if you uh, chew gum or start with early feeding, then you have uh, vagal activation, which uh, is associated with a restoration of uh, bowel uh, motil motility. So one of the uh, issues have been what's, what's a proper clinical endpoint for recovery of GI tract motility. So as part of the, the LAVA study, which we have conducted uh, around 10 years ago, we performed in this uh, randomized trial where we compared uh, four groups having either open surgery or laparoscopic surgery or enhanced recovery or standard care. We looked at the colonic transit in uh, the different patient groups. And then we saw that the colonic transit, a positive colonic transit, was best correlated with the combination of uh, the ability to tolerate solids and having defecation. Uh, so uh, if you look for uh, uh, the best clinical endpoint, which indicates that the GI tract is recovery, and you can use that for studies and, and let's say in your hospital, it's a combination of toleration of solids and uh, having a restored defecation. So what are risk factors for positive ileus? Well, this is all from a number of systematic reviews. Uh, they indicate that increased age is associated with uh, more ileus because that the overall capacity to recover from surgery is decreased. Also uh, the male gender, because you have apparently uh, a higher uh, activation of the sympathetic uh, nerve system and the uh, inflammation in male compared to women. We know that low albumin uh, can cause increased edema and stretch on the bowel, which is uh, not good for, uh, for the motility of the small bowel. Previous laparotomy and need for extensive adhesiolysis with manipulation uh, will increase uh, the release of uh, inflammatory uh, uh, cytokines and microfakes. Long duration of surgery, it's the same. Also open approach and also need for transfusion and crystalloids uh, will cause bowel wall edema uh, like the, uh, which, which is causing uh, uh, also reduced uh, motility. So what could we do to prevent uh, positive ileus? And now I come down to a number of uh, items which are also incorporated in the enhanced recovery program. And what you can do preoperatively is to reduce the insulin uh, resistance by carbohydrate loading before surgery. During surgery, of course, we have to prevent salt and fluid over overload. Uh, so there is a clear benefit in the scientific literature. The, we have different types of uh, anesthesia, IV, uh, lidocaine, and thoracic epidural. And they all work through opioid uh, sparing and have an anti-inflammatory uh, effect. Uh, but um, we have to appreciate that the thoracic epidural is also associated with increase in IV fluids administered by the anesthesiologist because the patient will have hypotension uh, during uh, surgery. And also they use 
sympathomimetics uh, in order to uh, uh, increase the blood pressure, both of which are not good for uh, the ileus. Uh, so it's uh, the, the consensus now that uh, a thoracic epidural is not very useful, particularly if you apply a minimal invasive approach or a small lower midline incision. Uh, so it's only useful if you do a, a big upper midline uh, laparotomy. Enhanced recovery, uh, but there's a whole set of uh, items uh, which are uh, increasing the, uh, uh, improving the motility uh, after surgery. And also laparoscopy is a very important factor because it induces less trauma and less pain and less need of uh, opi opioids. So after surgery, there are a number of factors which are associated with uh, uh, the prevention of positive ileus. Chewing gum uh, has, has been shown in some literature data uh, by phagial stimulation. And also there is some evidence that drinking coffee uh, is an important stimulus. Well, we all know that some of us uh, would benefit coffee after a breakfast, having a bowel movement. And that's also the same in uh, after surgery, apparently. Um, magnesium oxide is, a stimul is stimulatory, is helpful. Uh, NSAIDs are helpful because they, there's opioid sparing and they're anti-inflammatory, uh, a good effect uh, preventing uh, um, positive ileus. Nowadays, there's some reluctance to administer um, NSAIDs because they could be associated with anastomotic healing, but more recent evidence is showing that if you administer it for the first 48 hours, there's very little effect on your anastomotic uh, healing. Early feeding is helpful, uh, like in the ARIS program, because it stimulates uh, uh, the vagal activity. Uh, peripheral uh, mu opioid receptor antagonists uh, are shown to be helpful, but the problem there is that it's, the availability is limited, particularly in the US. They do have it, but not in Europe. Early uh, mobilization, is helpful preventing uh, positive ileus, nicotine use uh, because it's prokinetic for the colon. And there are some uh, ideas about acupuncture that it might be helpful, but that's practically not very uh, easy to apply that uh, uh, in a hospital after surgery. Well, what is not helpful, uh, there are all kinds of substances have been uh, investigated, propanolol, choline citrate, erythromycin, uh, Lexans, uh, Cimeticone, and Gastrocervin, they're for sure not helpful after surgery. So most of the preventive measures I showed you there are already incorporated in the ERAS program. And once again, uh, we have to take out the uh, thoracic epidural from the original ERAS items because it's not very beneficial, particularly in laparoscopic surgery because it increases the fluid requirements. Uh, the patients are not able to lose their urinary catheter, no, not able to mobilize. And so the epidurals in the randomized trials show to have a detrimental effect on recovery after surgery. And there are now two randomized trials showing that the thoracic epidural is slowing down positive recovery, particularly after minimal invasive surgery. This is a, a, a slide on which items of the enhanced recovery uh, factors are helpful for the, particularly helpful for the early recovery because not every item is as important. And then you can see that the most important is to uh, have an increased positive re recovery and reduced ideas is that the surgical approach is a minimal invasive one. And this has also been shown uh, already uh, in the LAVA study, which we uh, published uh, uh, in 2011. And so the minimal invasive surgery is the single most important factor for early recovery and probably also for prevention of ileus. Well, now you really have to watch because the coming slides are very important to give a proper answer on the, the questions I post. So what, are the, what is the diff, most important differential diagnosis of 
positive paralytic eyelids. Well, of course, you have to rule out secondary positive eyelids. So you have to rule out if there is an abscess or an anastomotic leak, which are which is causing the positive eyelids. That has, of course, a completely different management than if you have a, a paralytic eyelids. Then the gastroduodenal discoordination, you have to discriminate that from a positive ileus. And if you made a stoma in a patient, uh, an ileostomy, then sometimes due to edema, the outlet of the stoma is occluded, uh, reason why the patient will have an ileus. Uh, so this also has a different management than if you have a regular positive ileus. So what are the signs of gastroparesis? Uh, so positive gastroduodenal discoordination. So this is typically a patient who is not able to tolerate fluids and solids, but does have defecation or flatus, or if they have a stoma, they have a running stoma. And so uh, if you uh, remember the first question, this was a patient who passed uh, stool and flatus, but was not able to tolerate uh, fluids and solids. And this is typically for a gastroparesis. So there's not much literature around gastroparesis, how it's caused, but in my experience, I see the most patients who have gastroparesis are patients who have uh, a D3 right colectomy, where we uh, dissect close on the superior mesenteric vein, pulling on the uh, mesenteric root, and probably activating the sympathetic uh, plexus uh, around the silicus uh, axis. And uh, we also see it a lot after total colectomy, uh, both performed uh, laparoscopically. And so it's, I think it's probably an activation of the sympathetic nerve system because of uh, pulling uh, at the mesenteric root and in D3 right colectomy, probably even by uh, taking the, the nerves there. So this is an example of a patient who had a loop ileostomy with a positive outlet obstruction and there you have a typical picture of an ileus with dilated small bowel, which run all the way up to the ileostomy. So um, uh, this is not a, a paralytic ileus. This is a mechanical ileus because the, the content of the bowel is not able to pass the edema of the stoma. So how should we manage? Well, a regular positive ileus, uh, first of all, and once again, I tell you, rule out secondary causes. Uh, if there is an abscess or a leak, uh, uh, so you have to treat it in a different way. But in our hospital, uh, if the patient has a true paralytic ileus um, um, and we are at day five, then we would give this patient parental feeding because we cannot expect that the patient uh, will have a normal bowel movement and normal diet, let's say within a week. So then the patient is for two weeks without normal feeding. So if we see at day five that they're not able to tolerate uh, uh, food, then we give them uh, parental feeding, preferably with a pick line, which is very easily uh, inserted with a very low risk. You see how the, the pick line is uh, inserted in the elbow and, uh, and it really goes up to the uh, central uh, vein. So the management of gastrostasis is completely different because there the small bowel motility and the colon motility is intact. So there we can put in a uh, gastroduodenal feeding tube. And uh, in our hospital, we use a core track which is uh, a tube which can be installed by a trained nurse using uh, some devices to follow the catheter. So in the ward, they just put in the catheter and they can see with this specific device uh, where the tip of the catheter is located and whether they, whether they have been able to reach the, uh, the trite ligament for uh, feeding uh, behind the pyloric uh, muscle. Uh, if you have an uh, ileostomy with edema, we put in uh, a big Foley catheter and we suture it to the stoma plate. 
um, uh, we give the patient a fluid diet. Uh, so uh, if a patient has, uh, has an ileostomy after surgery, we give them a fluid diet because we know that if they immediately start on a solid diet, then uh, because of the edema, they can have a blockage and then, then an, uh, a stoma obstruction. If they have the stoma obstruction, then we put in uh, the Foley drain. Uh, we put it in, we leave it there for three to five days, not in and out and in and out because that increases the, the edema. We leave it in for three days and then we take it out. And uh, if, the, uh, if the ileus is uh, resolved. So in conclusion, uh, postoperative paralytic ileus, I think nowadays is probably less important uh, because we apply minimal invasive surgery and a whole set of items uh, which are uh, focusing at uh, an earlier recovery and the restoration of the digestive tract. Of course, we have to rule out other causes if we have ileus after surgery, anastomotic leak and abscesses, discriminate a positive ileus from gastroduodenal discoordination and also stoma outlet obstruction because the management is completely different. I thank you for your attention and maybe we can have the uh, questions back to see whether the audience uh, took advantage of this talk. So we start again with the first question. So 82 year old man, he is vomiting, but he is passing stool and he has no signs of an anastomotic leak because the parameters are normal and the CRP is low. So Please vote either for positive paralytic ileus, anastomotic leakages, gastrostasis, or opiate overdose. Well, that's uh, a great improvement. Thank you so much. Shall we go to the, uh, to the next one? It's indeed gastrostasis. Um, so if we have a gastrostasis, uh, how should we treat this? Uh, watchful waiting, total parental nutrition, core track or duodenal tube feeding, or real laparoscopy, real, real laparotomy. May I have your votes? Well, that's great. Also, uh, correct answer for the majority. Uh, so, gastroduodenal, uh, gastrostasis or gastroduodenal discoordination you treat with a duodenal feeding tube or a core track. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Willem, for this great presentation. Just one short question in between. Do you believe that uh, feeding patients enterally with an ileus uh, can improve uh, the the way they respond. So uh, this is always a discussion with the, the doctors on the ICU that they want to give enteral feeding with patients uh, on the ICU uh, in a low dose because it should stimulate the, the small bowel. What do you think about that? I think if they have a true paralytic ileus, then uh, it won't pass. No. And uh, of course, the ICU uh, guys there, they, uh, it's easier for them to... Uh, to do this because they have a lot of nurses who sample every hour the content of the stomach, but uh, in order to prevent aspiration. But if you, if you do this in the ward, you will kill your patient by aspiration. I agree. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Michael is going to talk uh, about bleeding postoperatively. Michael, if you want to share your presentation. I realized that uh, when preparing this this presentation, I realized that talking about bleeding isn't a, an easy case because uh, as surgeons, we probably all know how to recognize the bleeding, how to treat the bleeding. But if you look to the papers, if you look to the literature uh, in colorectal surgery, it turns out that there are more unknowns than, than knowns. Uh, this is the very famous paper, Classic Trial, and if you look to the data from the trial, it turns out that there is very little about postoperative uh, bleeding events. 
there is something about uh, intraoperative hemorrhages, uh, clinically significant hemorrhages, but uh, all the bleedings, postoperative bleedings, are put in the other uh, uh, complications. So we don't really know how how often they occur. Uh, similarly, uh, in color two trial, uh, the situation is similar. Uh, we don't really know how often this uh, uh, occurs. Uh, a little bit better, uh, it is in recent trials, I mean, a la carte and uh, ICOSOC trials, but still uh, the data is very, very, uh, very scarce. Uh, we can estimate that bleeding isn't very common in case of colorectal surgery. And I think this is true because uh, whereas we deal with leakage with um, infections, uh, we, we rarely have to deal with bleedings. Uh, another problem is the definition of bleeding. Of course, uh, there are a lot of definitions. There are papers on how to define bleedings, uh, how these um, definitions differ. And uh, we can have definitions very, I would say very liberal when we deal with bleeding, it means the patient needs to die or end up in ICU uh, or more uh, uh, different uh, definitions like bleeding has to be some symptomatic or uh, have to uh, cause some uh, hemoglobin drops. And uh, all these definitions have some uh, benefits, some, some advantages and, and drawbacks. And there is also one very uh, funny definitions that bleeding is something that has to be assessed by the surgeon. We all know how surgeons treat bleedings during surgery, so I don't think it's very, very uh, accurate definition. Um, in case of colorectal surgery, uh, we have, in fact, two very different kinds of bleedings. We have intraperitoneal bleedings and intraluminal bleedings, I mean, anastomotic bleedings. Uh, they are different in, uh, in treatment. Uh, of course, I'm not going to tell you how to treat, basically how to treat bleeding. I just want to uh, summarize uh, how to recognize the bleeding. Uh, we all have to uh, monitor the patient's vital signs. Uh, perhaps the important thing is that in young younger patients, they have a little bit more capacity, more uh, reserves than uh, older people. Therefore, they become stable longer. But of course, uh, even the youngest can sometimes collapse. Uh, what we find very uh, uh, useful is uh, the tachycardia and uh, blood pressure. This is something very typical for bleeding. Uh, reduction in urine output can be helpful, but in the ERAS, uh, protocol uh, age, uh, it is very difficult because most of our patients don't have um, uh, urine catheters or uh, they are removed very early. Uh, abnormal, abnormal capillary refill uh, is something that may be helpful, but you know it's very, very gross uh, symptom. Dizziness, paleness, uh, this is something that uh, can be worrying. Uh, in general, if a patient is uh, not fit to get out of bed on the next day, something is going on. This is our, our policy. Drainage can be helpful, but uh, in most of our uh, operations, uh, in most of our cases, we don't drain a patient. In rectal cases, we put a drain until the next day and uh, it is removed uh, after the patient is mobilized. Laboratory tests are can be useful, but uh, if the bleeding is really severe, you wait for the test and uh, sometimes you can't, you mustn't wait. And of course, um, ultrasound or CT may be helpful, especially ultrasound, which is very safe, very um, easy and very quick tool. And these are pictures you can sometimes see uh, in a patient with bleeding. Uh, you can see free fluid, uh, but one has to be careful because this is fresh blood. Uh, this is fresh blood with no clots. If the blood gets clotted, uh, it doesn't have to be uh, visible so, so well. So uh, these clots become hyper or more 
echoic than than just anechoic uh, blood like like in here. Uh, of course, there are a lot of uh, risk factors for bleeding. Uh, they are well known, well established, like anemia, hemophilia, history of bleedings. Uh, uh, all, most of them are related to the patient, but uh, of course, it doesn't have to mean that patient without risk factors uh, uh, will want develop bleeding. Yes, this is this is obvious. Operative time, uh, it's a risk factor, but I don't think that I don't think it's a direct risk factor. I think that operative time uh, means the surgery was difficult and therefore there were some problems and therefore uh, these problems can lead to further problems. And the question is how to treat uh, a bleeding. Yeah? Uh, if a patient is unstable, we of course proceed with surgery, but what if the patient isn't unstable? Uh, in laparotomy, uh, it is difficult to uh, open up a patient again, but in laparoscopy, uh, I think we have changed our policy uh, quite recently because uh, we think now that laparoscopy, a read laparoscopy is not a big problem for a patient and recovery can be even faster if you, if you uh, re-scope a patient and uh, see what's going on. Uh, this is one of our cases. It's not a colorectal case, it's a patient after bariatric surgery, but in general, uh, the idea is the same. You can see the patient had, has bleeding. Uh, you can see a lot of blood and uh, one doesn't have to be worried about the amount of blood. And uh, this is already the blood uh, which uh, is not used by the, by the body. Yeah? It's outside. Uh, one has to be very patient to remove all the blood. Uh, we start from uh, one quadrant and move uh, to the other and to the uh, to the other. Uh, of course, you have to be ready to tilt the patient, uh, just like for a regular surgery, because sometimes it, it makes the operation easier. Uh, sometimes the blood can uh, lead to par uh, paralysis of the bowel, so the bowel can be uh, distended, which makes the operation a, bit, a little bit more difficult. And uh, in many cases uh, it is difficult to find the source of bleeding this is very annoying uh, you are uh, opening a patient and you don't find anything but uh, after a while when you re remove and you evacuate the, the entire blood you use some uh, saline to to clean the peritoneum and you don't see the blood is not appearing anyway you can safely uh, uh, finish the operation. Of course, drainage, in my opinion, is, is necessary, especially if you if you, you use a lot of saline because uh, because uh, uh, it is difficult to evacuate all the fluid from the peritoneum. You can use gauze if it's necessary. Uh, if you want to uh, make the operating field dry, uh, sometimes you are not sure if it's still bleeding or not but this goes can can be can be very helpful and uh, of course it is time consuming it is probably more time consuming than uh, open surgery but well uh, the benefits are are obvious uh, the question is should we proceed with laparoscopic or open approach uh, when we have a patient with uh, that is bleeding uh, uh, we all know that instability, hemodynamic instability is a contraindication to laparoscopy. But on the other hand, if you suspect what can bleed, uh, uh, perhaps uh, it is, and of course, if you can deal with the laparoscopy very well, you can, uh, uh, you can find some benefits. And this is another case. It's a patient after um, uh, uh, J-pouch proctocolectomy two or three hours after surgery, he was still in the recovery room. Uh, uh, blood in drains was, uh, in the drain was, was found. Uh, the patient became unstable. 
and we decided to take him to the operating room and we decided to proceed with laparoscopy. And uh, uh, of course, the anesthetists was, were, weren't very keen on that, but uh, we, we just told them that perhaps laparoscopy can be uh, better. And uh, here you can see the active bleeding. Yeah, you can see fresh, uh, red blood, uh, it is evacuating from the pelvis. So I was afraid of uh, bleeding from the uh, area where the J pouch was. And it turned out that uh, it was bleeding from the mesentery. Uh, you can see it very, very nicely. Uh, this was a, perhaps a little bit more difficult case than, than usual because the patient uh, was quite tall and we, need, we needed to gain length uh, in case of J pouch. And we decided to cut the uh, superior mesentery artery to gain length. And this was the place where, uh, where the patient was, was, uh, was bleeding. Yeah? This is one of the option how you can gain length uh, if you need to to create a J pouch. And you can see here very nicely uh, arterial bleeding. Uh, uh, of course, I prefer to, uh, to stop the bleeding with any kind of mechanical um, uh, hemostasis, like a clip. It didn't work well here, so uh, we used just a regular old fashioned uh, ligature. Uh, of course, uh, after this uh, kind of uh, procedure, you need to do full inspection of the abdominal cavity, just in case the patient is bleeding from uh, some other uh, place. But uh, in this case, it wasn't. Uh, it was just the bleeding from the mesentery. So uh, to conclude, um, intraperitoneal bleeding is relatively rare. Uh, laparoscopy is safe and, in my opinion, should be preferred in the management of bleeding, even if the patient is unstable and you, you are feeling that you, you can deal uh, with the situation. Click, clipping or ligation is better than vessel sealers. Uh, uh, and uh, this is another option uh, that can happen, intraluminal bleeding. Uh, relatively rare. Uh, it happens in less than 1% of anastomosis. Uh, this is something that happens perhaps more often. We often hear from the patient that uh, on the next day or on, even on the day of surgery, they pass some blood through the anus, uh, but it usually becomes insignificant. But uh, significant bleedings occur in one of 100 um, anastomosis, I think. Uh, of course, there were a lot of studies trying to prove uh, what causes the bleeding. This is an old Cochrane review that showed that hand soon anastomosis is perhaps safer, but it is based on very small samples. And uh, I don't even believe that uh, we, we would change our practice from staplers, especially in the left-sided resections to a hand soon and anastomosis just because it causes less bleeding. I don't believe it will ever happen. Uh, but on the other hand, mm, there were also studies comparing other types of surgery. This is, for instance, idiocolic resection, uh, where, where the authors compared three groups, circular staplers. I haven't try this myself, uh, linear side-to-side -side and manual side-to-side -side anastomosis. And it turned out that uh, these circular staplers uh, uh, can lead to higher bleeding incidence. Uh, in this study, it was the only cause of uh, post-operative bleeding uh, in comparison to two other groups. Uh, my preference is to do either hand soon or a stapled side-to-side -side anastomosis in, uh, in right hemicolectomy, uh, especially if it's intracorporeal. Uh, and the question is what to do if you are dealing with uh, intraluminal bleeding. In most cases, conservative management is uh, sufficient. Uh, this is either not very uh, 
severe bleeding, it stops uh, after uh, a couple of hours or it is, it's insignificant. Uh, another option is um, endoscopic management, uh, clipping. Uh, in case of left-sided resection, it is quite easy because the anastomosis is very low. So uh, it's, it doesn't require much um, experience. It's even easier than in, for instance, in, in, the, um, uh, in the stomach. Uh, so clipping is very, very useful option. And uh, of course, sometimes we need to uh, proceed with surgery. This is a video showing what can happen if you are uh, not careful. Uh, the surgeon is doing intracorporeal anastomosis using stapler. And this uh, is what we always do. Uh, we always look into the lumen of the bowel just to see if it's not bleeding. And of course, in this situation, uh, there is a minor bleeding, uh, which has to be managed somehow. Uh, in this case, uh, it was enough to clip. I don't like uh, coagulation in this situation. I think that mechanical uh, hemostasis, either clipping or su suing is, is just safer for the anastomosis. And another situation, um, uh, it's already two days after, it's after gastric bypass surgery. So it's still not the uh, colorectal resection. Uh, we had a patient with symptoms of gastro upper GI bleeding. Uh, he had gastroscopy, nothing. And we thought that uh, perhaps it's uh, the jejuna, jejuna anastomosis bleeding, and it was true. So you can see laparoscopic approach to this procedure. We opened the blind stump of the anastomosis just to confirm it's bleeding. Yes, it was bleeding. And uh, in a perfect situation, uh, through the opening of the blind stump, uh, we would be able to, to fix the bleeding, but not in this case. It was too deep. We weren't able to find the bleeding. Uh, so uh, unfortunately, we had to, we we're trying very hard to, to fix the bleeding without uh, disrupting the anastomosis, but it didn't work. Uh, so we had to open the anastomosis, uh, unfortunately. Uh, this is an old video uh, where we used Vicryl sutures. Now we are using mostly Velox sutures, which I prefer, um, and I think they are safer. Uh, and you can see that after opening the anastomosis, the bleeding becomes more uh, more active, more severe. A little bit of cleaning just to confirm where's the source of bleeding, where's the spot. And yeah, here it is. Uh, it is not very severe. So we have time here. We can uh, be careful. Uh, we don't have to hurry. Uh, we don't want to do more damage. And as I told you, oversuing is in my opinion, better than, uh, than coagulation. Uh, so oversuing uh, should fix the bleeding. And of course, in now we have two holes. Uh, one is the blind stump, which is open, and this is, uh, this is also open. So I will show you what to do next. Uh, this doesn't happen too often. So uh, it's good to have the strategy, what to do when you start your re-laparoscopy or uh, re-laparotomy. Uh, yeah, and now we confirm it's, it's uh, not bleeding anymore. Another stitch just for a good sleep, I think. Um, I don't really think it was necessary here, but on the other hand, uh, perhaps it was just to strengthen the uh, the area where uh, where we are suing and we are closing the uh, the defect as previously uh, just to the wall of the small bowel was quite 
uh, nice. So uh, we were sure that it will heal uh, and it healed in fact. So just over sewing, we always do one single layer uh, running suture and as, as I told you now VLOG or uh, monofilaments suture, I think it, they, they are better for, yeah, for, for anastomosis. And the last step is to close the, the defect. We'll move forward. Yeah, and the, this, is, this can be easily closed with the stapler. Uh, it is the safest way, I think, and the quickest way. And so the procedure uh, uh, and the procedure goes. Yes. Fortunately, this uh, doesn't happen too often, but if it happens, it's good to have the strategy. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope I have showed you some ideas what to do in case of bleeding so that you are not afraid anymore. Thank you. Uh, for Andreas, there were a couple of questions. Um, and the first question is, do you have a cutoff point in CRP and you measure it daily to, uh, to uh, diagnose the bleeding? The leakage. Yeah, uh, the leakage. No, yeah, sorry. Uh, we don't have the daily practice. Usually, if everything was fine, we do it one time on post-operative day two. And then it depends on this clinical presentation and on of the initial initial value of the CRP word. But usually we do it only once, and when everything is fine, we do not do any laboratory findings anymore. There are some studies which report that if you have a CRP of about 120 or higher, then it's a risk factor for leakage. And there's even people who make CTs if uh, if the CRP is this high. Um, you don't have any experience with it. Michael Willem, do you have experience with that, the, the cutoff point for, for CRP? Uh, we, we don't have a cutoff point, but uh, if it's, I mean, we, we measure it day by day. If it's getting higher, we add procalcitonin. If it's high, uh, then we do CT. Okay. Because really? measuring it after five days, it's it's not useful because most of these patients are ready to go home earlier. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So so we measure at day three and day four, and um, well, if if it's well below one hundred, we feel comfortable. But it's particularly the trend which is important. So uh, day three, you expect a higher CP than at day four. And uh, so, if, if and if, if there's any suspicion, then we do a CT scan, particularly in low anastomosis, where we have a, di a little bit different policy in treating this. Uh, so we are not defunctioning the low anastomosis. So if they leak, they will for sure have a CRP peak. Then if they leak, then we do a washout, give them an ileostomy, and then we put in the endosponge. We only exchange this two or three times, and then we primary close the anastomotic defect after cleansing of the cavity. And this, this uh, works very well. And uh, in, in our opinion, it's better than uh, making the endosponge smaller and smaller and then wait for five, six weeks until the sinus is closed. Okay. Actually, there is a lot of literature from, from the St. Gallen group um, and we are doing that on day two and day four, and the predictive uh, value of uh, on day four, it's lower than 56. That's most predictive, and, and also the change between day two and day four. There, there is a lot of literature coming from St. Carl. The, the, I think the problem with the, the cutoff value of the CRP is that it completely depends whether you did your operation open or laparoscopic. This is what the St. Gallen group showed because you have in St. Gallen, they have a lower cutoff for laparoscopy than for open surgery. And so I, I think uh, it, it should be well below 100 and then the trend is very important. So uh, I think that's why you measure day two and day four to see a, a going down trend.
Absolutely. Beside all that, what Andrea said, that's it's mainly the clinics you have to treat yeah. and not the laboratory. Yeah. Yeah, but, but you can diagnose some leakage early if you have a trend. Uh, because if you do it purely on the clinic, then you go back to, to uh, a lot of years ago. And then most of the times we were a little bit late diagnosing the leakage. So I agree with Willem and you that the trend is really important. Another question of the audience is, do you oversuture the staple lines? Andreas, do you always oversuture? You oversuture it when it leaks, but do you always oversuture every staple no, line? No, we do not do a routine oversuturing the staple lines. Anybody else does that? Yeah, we do mainly. Uh, sorry. No, please. Willem, you can. Yeah, we, we uh, now, now, uh, but in the low anastomosis where we, uh, yeah, we apply the transanal technique where the anastomoses are generally uh, even lower than uh, than the top down uh, technique. Uh, it's very easy to visualize the anastomosis and oversue it. So we 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 do that both in pouch surgery as well in uh, collateral anastomosis. For the normal right hemocolectomy staples, you don't oversuture. No. No, okay, then we all agree. Uh, no, there was also a question, do you standardly use drains? I know the answer, but uh, anybody, uh, because Willem stated that it might even uh, uh, create an, uh, an ileus or postoperative uh, bowel obstruction. So anybody still in favor of, of standard drains postoperatively? Well, if, if, the, uh, if the dissection has, has been intraperitoneal, then we don't use drains, but if you have a TME type of dissection where you have a big, uh, uh, let's say, dead space behind your neorectum, then we like to drain that for two days. Okay. I agree with William, especially in those after radiation for, for TME cases, that's the only we have, we have drainage, but yeah. the others we don't. That's how also we do it. Not in colon surgery, but it, after TME, we put in a drain. We'll leave it for 24 hours, just. Okay. Oh, that's great, and we all agree. Willem, another question for you. Uh, in your uh, presentation, you stated that there's no more room for uh, gastrographene uh, to reduce postoperative ileus or erythromycine. Uh, can you comment on that? Yes, well, uh, for, for uh, gesogravin, the, the small evidence to reduce ileus for gesogravin is only in the, um, in the uh, uh, acute ileus. Uh, so patients who come in with an ileus, uh, probably due to adhesions, but not in the postoperative setting. There's no evidence at all for this. And uh, there has been a very nice systematic re review uh, recently uh, published in the American, Sur an American surgeon, American surgery, uh, showing this uh, with respect to erythromycin, uh, it probably won't work on positive ileus. It might work on gastrostasis, uh, like the uh, HPB surgeons. They sometimes use it, but also there the evidence is very, very weak. So our HPB surgeons don't do not use it routinely for gastrostasis, but for positive ileus, there are no data supporting that. Okay, thank you very much. Um, then I have a last question for Michael, uh, or two last questions. Um, do you have experience with tri-stapling and uh, the fact that it might increase the bleeding of the anastomosis? because it should yeah. stimulate, uh, do you have any other of the faculty has experience with tri-stapling no. and uh, a possible increase in bleeding? Because it, the whole theory is that it should bring more blood to the anastomosis, no increased bleeding? No. Nobody, okay. And um, is there room for coiling? Uh, so interventions of the radiologist if you have a post of the bleeding? Michael, for you. Uh, well, it's a wonderful tool, but I don't think it's a good tool in colorectal surgery. In HPB surgery, in pancreatic surgery, if the patient is bleeding from the mm, 
pancreatic vessels let's let's call them like that it's a great tool because you the access to after whipple it's very difficult but in colorectal surgery most of bleedings are just from 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 a small vessel or or very not very dynamic yeah but uh, of course if if it's if it's a big vessel probably it will help but uh we have never done it in colorectal surgery it's a routine in pancreatic but not not in colorectal any of the other uh, faculty members does it help you with the post operative bleeding maybe to localize the place of the bleeding well I think post of the bleeding after uh, colorectal surgery, uh, uh, in principle, you should do a real laparoscopy or real laparotomy if it was a laparotomy. Uh, of course, in in in, in HPB and es and esophageal surgery, it's different. But I don't want to embolize my anastomosis. No. Um, one of the one of one of the tricks I think is that uh, sometimes if you have a severe bleeding, then uh, if you real, do a real laparoscopy, there are a lot of clots and it's very difficult to get them out with your uh, small suction device. So what I then do is that uh, if we have, for instance, a left collect left sided colectomy with a funnel seal incision where we extracted the specimen, I put in a hand port, port there in order to manually remove all the clots and then uh, you have room for uh, laparoscopic irrigation and finding the, the bleeding. Uh, because the, the most important problem is in, in bleeding with re, uh, re-intervention laparoscopically is that you're not able to get rid of the, the big clots. Uh, so there the hand port, might, hand port might be helpful. Yeah, that's a great advice, William. Thank you very much. Uh, so these were all the questions. Um, so on a what do you say? Well, I, I want also to add something uh, to to the last to the bleeding part because I think Michel Michel was was really good to showing that first will be either endoscopy or the operation, but there is no place for um, any any angiographic uh, coiling uh, to the anastomosis. So I, I completely agree, and and it's also the truth as as William said. That if you if you have the bleeding and you did um, uh, laparoscopic before, you can try to do laparoscopy. That's not the problem, even if it's intraluminal and it was not possible to do it endoscopic. And then you can mobilize maybe, for example, if it's the right side, you can mobilize and, and put it extra uh, corporal to open up the, the, the anastomosis. That's also a possibility. Just mobilize a little bit more, put in an Alexis retractor, then you can you can keep it out. I think that's a good idea. And what I saw on the on the video, if you have intra-abdominal bleeding, so maybe try to use a big camera with a good light, make a big suction and not a small one. And, and there you could take, for example, the air seal that you have enough air always inside to you can do brilliant suction, and then you put in a swab to make compression at the most uh, um, at the, the most place you think there will be the bleeding. So this will help to get it under control until you really find the vessel which it was. Okay, thank you, Walt, Maybe. for this addition. Andreas, yes, I think we have one more minute. I, I would like to ask Willem about something. Um, as you said, in uh, TME anastomosis, you do not do routinely uh, a lupidostomy, but there are some, just for our audience, there are some guidelines, some recommendation that after TME, an anastomosis below five centimeter should be diverted, so there should be an, an, a protective stoma. So what about the medical legal aspects if you have a, a leak then? Well, I think, I think it's, uh, there, there's no evidence at all that uh, defunction stoma prevents the leak. It only mitigates uh, the consequence of the leak. But if you have a good system in place to diagnose the leak early, so that in our in our practice it's always at day four because we do the three day day three and day four CRP, then the leak is still confined to the pelvis, so the patient quite often doesn't have any severe symptoms at that point, and we already diagnose the leak, and then of course 
you have to get in immediately and make a stoma and drain it within the sponge. And the danger of doing an ileostomy is that you will have a number of leaks that you do not diagnose early. So uh, you will find the leak, let's say three months after surgery when you want to close the stoma. And then there's no room anymore for endosponge assisted closure of the defect. Most of these patients, they had radiotherapy. So they have, will have a cavity which is completely fibrotic. Uh, the neorectum uh, is completely fibrotic. And uh, then they're probably stuck up with a, a redo, a big redo operation. And so uh, avoiding the stoma, you have to have a system in place to diagnose early and act immediately. I completely agree with you. Then it's safe. And we know that in new data, uh, population-based data, that the mortality of uh, rectum surgery is below 1% uh, because of nowadays management. It's not in the, like in the old days. So you can do that safely. And I think if you put up a stoma, what we do in our unit is that if we give the patient a stoma, we still give patients stomas, then we check the anastomosis within two weeks, not after three months, but within two weeks, because if you find a leak within two weeks, you can still apply and the sponge assisted closure and salvage the anastomosis without a big redo operation. And then the rest of your tear is, is use the endosponge for, uh, uh, for three to five times. Don't uh, make it smaller. Exactly. That's what and so we, we don't use it for uh, trying to close the cavity. We only use it to clean the cavity and then we close the anastomotic dehiscence uh, in the theater by uh, new sutures. Okay, and then you drain the, 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 the leave a drain in that? Uh... Yeah. And so when, when we close, we, uh, we leave a small drain for three days in the cavity uh, and uh, we give the patient 10 days antibiotics and we check the anastomosis of we check the closure after two weeks eh, because if you failed, you can you can continue with endosponge. Okay. We have we have showed now in uh, ileal pouches that we have been able to uh, effectively close all leaks uh, in a series of around twenty five patients over many years, and uh, that the uh, function of these patients is similar to patients who did not have a leak. And, uh, and the pouch and, failure as well. Uh, because if you very quickly treat the pelvic sepsis, it does not have the detrimental effect on the ne ne uh, neorectum. And what I kind think of this is quite, quite important, as, as William said, that you, that you are fast there and avoid that there is a big, big uh, pelvic uh, inflammation. So if you're soon there, it, it's really also from the function, it's better. Yeah. Willem, last question. Uh, how, what kind of drain do you use and, and how do you lead it outside? Do you put it through the anastomosis or do you, uh, how do you manage to drain? Yeah, so, so we use the uh, uh, a very uh, 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 typically an eight uh, drain uh, and uh, with a small uh, needle on it. And we, we, we uh, stick it through the sphincter. Uh, so not through the anastomosis but we bring it out through the pelvic floor and leave it in for three days. Okay. So okay, not anastomotic, but, 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 but through the pelvic floor, yeah. You, you are not afraid of creating a fistula then? We haven't seen that so far. Okay. Good. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for the faculty for the great uh, presentations and the answering of the questions. Mm -hmm.